كن بهذا العصر من أعلامه كن بهذا العصر من أعلامه إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we finished talking about the main points regarding the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. And we mentioned the Mahdi, and we bring him in as part of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet ﷺ did mention that he is going to come before the end of time. So he is in that regard a sign from the signs of the Day of Judgment. But also because the Prophet ﷺ prophesied about him. And a lot of the major signs and minor signs are linked to and around the Mahdi. So the coming of Isa ﷺ, the fighting of the Dajjal, the, the second opening of Constantinople, etc. A lot of it is linked to the Mahdi. So we mention him when we talk about the signs of the Day of Judgment. The difference between the Mahdi's lesson and the lessons uh, that we mentioned before is before with the minor signs, we're just going through them quickly. The Mahdi will actually you know, have to do over a few lessons. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of information and misinformation regarding the Mahdi. So inshallah, Azza wa Jal, what we'll do is we'll take a very any brief introduction today and then we're going to, over the next few weeks, inshallah, uh, speak about the specific ahadith uh, reported about the Mahdi. We'll speak about some of the differences between the belief of Ahl Sunnah in the Mahdi and the belief of the Shia in the Mahdi. And we'll also speak about you know, or, and reply back to some misconceptions that people have regarding the Mahdi. There's a lot of shubuhat, there's a lot of misconceptions, misinformation, and we'll explain inshallah why that is and uh, what the correct understanding of Ahl Sunnah is and replying back to those misconceptions. First and foremost, why is there so much misconception about the Mahdi? Why is there so much misinformation about the Mahdi? There's a few reasons. The first one is the people's want for the Mahdi. When people really want something, you always find that a lot of fairy tales end up getting attached to that one. It's like anything in life. When a person really wants something, really desires something, and they can't get it, the person's mind starts making up so many uh, yani utopian ideas regarding that person or regarding that thing. Uh, human nature, al mamnu'a marghub, as they say in Arabic. Uh, that which is prohibited or not in arm's reach is wanted, it's desired. Everyone that doesn't have a wife, for example, thinks, oh, as soon as I get a wife, my life is going to be okay. Uh, other people, uh, if kids, as soon as I have kids, my life's going to be okay. As soon as I get that job, my life's going to be okay. And as soon as I get my dream house, my life's going to be okay. So that which we want, we always attach so much to. We know, and this is a correct belief, we know that in the time of Al-Mahdi, Allah Azza wa Jal will, through the Mahdi, return the earth back to a place of goodness. He will remove oppression, He will give victory to the Muslims. The Muslims will unite underneath Al-Mahdi. So as Muslims, especially the, the past how many uh, decades, we've been really yearning for such a time. We've been yearning for a Muslim leader to come, to unite the Muslims, to give the Muslims victory, to remove the oppression, oppression in our lands, in our countries, upon our individuals, etc. And this is something that the Allah Azza wa will allow the Mahdi to do. This is something that Allah Azza wa will allow the Mahdi to do. And so because it's a one of ours, everyone is sitting there waiting for the Mahdi. Everyone cannot wait for the Mahdi to come. And unfortunately, sometimes that uh, love and that wanting and that yearning for him to come has added to the people's uh, misinformation about the Mahdi and about what the Mahdi will do and sometimes even who the Mahdi is. Another reason for there to be a lot of misinformation about the Mahdi is that the two sources that talk about Al-Mahdi, there is some uh, deficiency Regarding this, regarding themselves, the biggest misconception uh, source is from the Shia. The Shia's belief about the Mahdi are extremely far-fetched, to put it in a nice way. Not only are they baseless, yani shar'an from the Quran, from the Sunnah, from even their ahadith. Now, not only are they baseless, but they also, yani they're not logical. They're not logical. For example, that the Mahdi is alive now, and he's been alive since you know, 1,250 years. 
Now I'm the only man alive, mashallah, since that time. You know, it's baseless you know, in their religion and it's you know, nonsensical. And this is something which is you know, rejected altogether because we don't take uh, from the Shia. The second place a lot of people use regarding matters of the Mahdi are weak or fabricated ahadith. Weak or fabricated ahadith. We spoke when we spoke about the signs of the Day of Judgment, how important it is to ensure that the ahadith that we use are authentic or acceptable, sahih or hasan, and that it's not allowed to use weak ahadith, ahadith da'ifa, or ahadith matruka, uh, fabricated ahadith. We're not allowed to take them, especially in matters of aqidah, in matters of uh, belief, matters of iman, and matters to do with the unseen, this has to only be a matter of a hadith which is sahih or hasan. We cannot take a weak hadith because it's to do with the knowledge of the unseen. So when we speak about the Mahdi, the authentic hadith are simple and plain and straightforward. The problem is, as human beings, do we like simple, plain, straightforward things? Or we like to spice it up a bit? We always like to spice it up a bit. One of the things that helps spice it up is the weak hadith that come with it. So some people, unfortunately, what they ended up doing is as they're mentioning uh, talks about the Mahdi and information about the Mahdi, they'll include in it weak narrations. So one thing which inshallah we'll try and do in the book that we're following, alhamdulillah, the Sheikh Aslan has done it already for us, is to ensure that we only use authentic or acceptable ahadith. As for the weak narrations, then they're not, they're not, we won't speak about them, even though we'll mention that they are weak. But when we speak about the Mahdi himself and information regarding the Mahdi, uh, obviously, we won't mention any of them, insha'Allah. So these are the two main sources for this misinformation. The belief of the Shia and what they spread about the Mahdi, and also the weak and fabricated ahadith. What we need to use and only use regarding the Mahdi is either the Qur'an, which the Mahdi is not directly mentioned in the Qur'an, or the uh, authentic ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu Whenever we speak about brothers, matters of the unseen, whenever we speak about matters of the unseen, it can only be from these two sources. If I say I had a dream that the day of judgment is in uh, 2050, you cannot use my dream as an evidence for something that's going to happen. You can't say part of our aqidah now is that the day of judgment is in 2050. Why? Because my dreams are not an evidence in matters of aqidah. They're not an evidence. The only thing that's an evidence in matters of Aqidah is the Qur'an or the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The belief in the Mahdi because it's belief from Ilm al ghaib it's belief of knowledge of the unseen can also only come from these two sources. Our mind, our intellect has nothing to do with it. It only comes from the Qur'an or authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just a quick, a very quick introduction to who the Mahdi is. And then inshallah in the upcoming weeks we'll go into more detail. He is a man from the children of Adam, a normal man. The Mahdi is not someone special in the sense that he's a prophet or uh, in the sense that he has special powers. He is not of, uh, or is not of that kind. The prophets have finished with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people even claim that the Mahdi is a prophet and this is obviously wrong. Now the last prophet to come is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's part of your belief. Khatam al-Anbiya wa rusul As Allah Azza wa mentioned, he's the seal of prophets and messengers. So there's no one to come as a prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is a normal man. He doesn't have any powers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described him as a normal man. And part of our belief as Muslims is that men are men. We don't have, we don't have special powers. The only ones that can perform miracles are the prophets. And Allah Azza wa gives the ability from some of, for some of the awliya to also perform what we call in English miracles. In Arabic they're called karamat. Yani it is very possible that from the awliya of Allah Azza wa yani the extremely close servants of Allah Azza wa that they'd be able to perform things that normally men would not be able to perform. This is possible, but it never takes them above the level of a man. They are men that Allah Azza wa has honored. Al-Mahdi is a man which Allah Azza wa Jal or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have not told us about any special powers and so we take him as a normal man. He's not going to come fly in the sky or you know, travel the earth extremely quickly. The, the, jail is not, the Mahdi doesn't have that. He's a normal man. The Mahdi is from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So he is from uh, the descendants of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is linked to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we know in the Sharia, Al al-Bayt have a special place in Islam. This is also a big mistake between uh, the ignorant ones from Ahl sunnah and the Shia where some of the Sunnah don't know, Ahl sunnah they don't know and some of the Shia, they believe that we don't like the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is, you know, could not be further from the truth. We as Ahl sunnah the people who follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we believe that the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they're to be honored. The family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they're to be honored, they're to be held in high esteem, they're to be looked after, therefore, you know, they're people that are respected 100%. And this is in the Quran, Ilan Mawadat fil Qurba, when Allah tells us to be good to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he would tell us that, uh, you know, make sure you look after, you know, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, make sure you look after my family, usikum bi ahl bayti, make sure you look after my family after me. You have to honor and look after the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Mahdi will be from. The family of the Prophet وسلم, which is our highest status, and he's from Quraysh. And the Islamic leadership, the Khilafah, is meant to be from Quraysh. The Islamic leadership, if we have an ideal leader, uh, a choice between yani, a person who's from, for example, Lebanon, and a person who's from Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet وسلم, we have to choose the person from Quraysh. It's only, you're only allowed to have a Khalifa. Not an, a leader like an Amir. We're talking about the leader of all of the Muslims. It's only when there's no one from Quraysh to take the leadership properly who's able to do it that you give it to someone other than a person from Quraysh. But when there's a choice, it has to be given to Quraysh. That's why, if you remember in the Seerah, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, some of the people from the Ansar they said that we want the leadership after the Prophet ﷺ. Now that he's passed away. And we're in Al Medina, we're the people of Medina, and we gave victory to the Prophet. ﷺ. We believe that we have a, a position of leadership amongst the Muslims. But then they were reminded that the Prophet ﷺ said that this matter, which is the Khilafah, is for Quraysh. And that's when they chose Abu Bakr. He has this trait that is uh, from the family of the Prophet, ﷺ, and he's from Quraysh, and he's worthy. And so this is why he's a person which will very easily take over the position of the Khilafah, the Islamic leadership, and he will lead uh, the Muslims to success and victory by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also know his name. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that ismuhu ismi, wa, and, and, and his name is my name, and ism abihi, ism abi. The name of his father will be the name of my father. So, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, just like the Prophet ﷺ was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Al Mahdi will also be called Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And some of the ulama said it could also be Ahmed ibn Abdullah, because another name of Muhammad ﷺ is Ahmed. So it could be Muhammad or Ahmed ibn Abdullah, and he's from Quraysh. He's from the family, the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ. Is he alive today? Golden question. Very simple answer is, no. what if he is? You say Allahu Alam. Is he alive today? We say Allahu Alam. If he's alive, it's because he's born, not because he's been alive for over a thousand years. This is 100% not correct. Now, as some of the Shia say that he's like the 12th Imam and he ran away and hid in a cave and he's waiting to come out. What's the guy waiting for? It's been 1250 years. And Anjad, and this is the time for him to come out, Habibi. La. Uh, this is their belief and there's no evidence for it whatsoever, nor is it you know, something which comes into the mind. The, as we mentioned, he's a normal man like any other man. He will be born and he will be raised like a normal person. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, as will come with us, will fix him overnight. And he will actually make him ready overnight. Now, as for him being ready, no, he's not ready. Uh, or sorry, not, he's not alive today. From what we know, if it means that he's been alive for over a thousand years. Is he born yet? Allahu A'lam. We don't know when he's born or when he's going to be. So we always say, Allahu A'lam. Is he part of the 12 Imams? Aslan, as, as Ahlul Sunnah, we have nothing to do with the 12 Imam beliefs. Naam. This matter of Imamah, 
and this is always linked to Al Mahdi, this matter of Imamah, this is an innovation which the Shia themselves they came up with. That uh, it has to be the leaders of the Muslims have to be from uh, Al Al Bayt, specifically from Ali radiallahu anhu, and they have special abilities, like they have knowledge of the unseen, like they can live you know, almost for eternity. Uh, like some of the Shia have said that they're better than the prophets. All of this is wrong. And all of this is kufr, because it clearly goes against the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, in matters of belief. Uh, so the, the matter of 12 Imams, and is he, is he the 12th Imam? That's got nothing to do with Ahl Sunnah. And even the Shia has got nothing to do with them. They made it in order for them to defend it. They changed the Quran because of it, not the Quran itself. The understanding of the Quran because of it. They fabricated a hadith because of it. They changed their own belief system because of it. You know, in the Shia, you have, like, for example, the Ismailis. Okay? The Ismailiyah. Their Ismailiyah broke up from the Shia because of this issue. Because of the issue of Imamah. Because the Shia, they end up changing the rules and they say, like, you change it, you can't change it. So we're going to stop on, the, on Ismail and you guys continue with others. So this issue of Imamah, it's got nothing to do with Quran or Sunnah or even with them, some, anything authentic. This is all fabricated from them. And they say uh, Al-Mahdi is the 12th Imam for them. This has nothing to do with our belief. As we mentioned, he's a righteous man which Allah Azza wa will give victory to the Ummah with. Uh, also regarding uh, Al-Mahdi, uh, some of the Ahadith, okay, some of the Ahadith. This is where you start to get uh, some issues with some of the understandings. The Prophet ﷺ did mention a narration that the armies would come from the east and they will be carrying black flags. And if you see them, then go and give them victory even if you have to crawl over ice. These narrations, and we're going to get into more specifics inshallah in the upcoming weeks. The first part of it, that this, the, an army will come from the east, ulama of hadith, some of them said this is authentic, no issue. The last part is the problem. The last part is the problem where it says that it will be the Khalifa of Allah, the successor of Allah, Al-Mahdi. This last part is the problem. The authentic narration, they don't have this last part. وَهُوَ خَلِيفَةُ اللَّهِ الْمَهْدِي It doesn't, doesn't have that part. That part the ulama said is weak. That part the ulama said is weak. But, you know, how do you, how, some, of, some of you may ask, how do some of the ulama say Wallah, this part is authentic and that part is weak. Because this, this actually gets asked in some ahadith. You have, for example, 10 students. Or 10 ulama of hadith, I should say. These 10 ulama of hadith, they all narrate the first part of the hadith without that last part. And he will be the successor of Allah, the Mahdi. They all narrate this. Then one of the scholars or one student of knowledge, he narrates the hadith with that addition. So you have 10 people that said one part of the hadith and then you had one person by himself that said the last part of the hadith. If he's not extremely strong in memorization, the ulama will say, this is riwaya munkara. Riwaya munkara means there's an additional part or there's a change which is not acceptable. Why did these 10 who are strong scholars of hadith only narrate the hadith with that amount and he by himself in his weak in memorization uh, uh, narrate that part by himself? So it's rejected. The problem, as we mentioned, some of the ulama that want to add more weight to that story, they'll add that with their talks. Naam. So we say this narration, that part is authentic, the part that says is a Mahdi is weak, but some of the ulama, some of the ulama still accepted, even though they know that that part is weak, still accepted that the fact that he'll come from the east and he'll, he will be the leader of that army, Carrying the black flags, just like the Prophet used to have those black flags, then this is just like he's upon the way of the Prophet and he's following in the footsteps of the Prophet and he'll carry flags like the Prophet, then this is authentic and it's allowed for us to take and to believe that it's Al Mahdi. We say Allahu Alam, we say Allahu Alam, and uh, the, him coming from the east is no issue to believe him, but where exactly he'll come from, there's nothing narrated that's authentic. So we say Allahu Alam. Where exactly he will come from? Now, where he is given bay'ah, we'll talk about. Where he fights, we'll talk about, insha'Allah. But where exactly he comes from, and when exactly he comes, all of this is Allahu Alam. 
we cannot say it's going to be like this without that or that because we don't have anything authentic narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that came to us in the Quran. Finally, and this is an important part, whilst we wait for the Mahdi, what do we do in the meantime? Unfortunately, there are people who they sit on their hands and say we can't do anything until the Mahdi comes. And this has never been the understanding of Ahlul Sunnah. Never. Been the understanding of the people of the Sunnah of the Prophet. Rather, what we're commanded to do is to try our best. Whether the Mahdi is here, whether he comes tomorrow, whether he comes in 15 years, whether he comes in 150 years, Allahu A'lam. Our job is not to worry when the Mahdi will come. Because if it was our job to worry, Allah Azza wa would have told us exactly when it is. Just like Allah didn't tell us when we're going to die, and Allah didn't tell us when the Day of Judgment is. Our belief is that we believe that we're going to die, and we believe in the Day of Judgment. We also believe in the Mahdi. What is our job to prepare the best as, as best as we can? That comes from us learning, us implementing, and spreading and trying to establish the deal of Allah Azza wa Jal to the best of our ability. If we're lucky enough to be with uh, the Mahdi and for Allah Azza wa to allow us to be blessed with being in the in the in the army and being supporters of Al Mahdi, and, and we're sincere and we're firm and we're able to live and die upon that, then this is Khair wa Barakah. But do I sit at home waiting for that time? Like, there's so much to do now, so much that we can do now, and that's what we're responsible for and what we're going to be held accountable for. If we live and say Al Mahdi, Khair wa Barakah, but if not, then this is, uh, if we die before that, then we still get rewarded from Allah Azza wa Jal for the efforts that we're able to do today. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding the Mahdi uh, and the, the things that the, the Mahdi will do, some of the ulama said, you know, just so you get an idea of how the ulama spoke about preparing for the Mahdi, they said, Al Mahdi won't come until Asan there's already a Khilafah. Some of the ulama actually said, the Mahdi will not come until there's already a Khilafah. Why they, why they said that? Some of them said, and again, we'll be talking about it a lot more in detail in the upcoming weeks, because the people will give him bay'ah. Uh, in uh, Hajj time, by like giving the Pledge of Allegiance in the Hajj time, and that he will lead the Muslim army. The fact that there's a Muslim army means that they're meant to be united, and the changes that he's done is within only seven years' time. The Prophet specified the changes that he comes with are done in seven years' time. So they said for him to do that, there must be already a lot of goodness present. Again, Allahu A'lam, but because it's a matter of difference of opinion, but what we know is that the fact that strong scholars, and from the contemporary ones, Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, strong scholars, that was their belief that us and the Mahdi will not come until the Muslims are ready for al-Mahdi, for him to come and really uh, torpedo these changes. This is a sign that we need to continuously work and work tirelessly for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, trying to learn better ourselves and establish the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. Not uh, sit on our hands and wait for the Mahdi. This is just a quick introduction to who the Mahdi is and you know, just a clarification on some of the issues that are related to the misinformation about Al-Mahdi and inshallah the next few weeks there are going to be a lot more specifics about Al-Mahdi and answering a lot of misconceptions regarding him.